Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fuss. We're here for another edition of the show. I'm here with Tracy. Tracy, I forgot your last name. Kendall. Mark. Kendall. I knew that. <laughs> I saw the email, but so I'm sorry. So Tracy, uh, with uh, should I say Nicola J or Nicola J? Nicola J. Nicola J. Nicola J. All right. Um, but as if you're in America, you're gonna say Nicholas, right? So um, so Nicola J. And we just uh, went into uh, the vineyard, uh, the Bishop Vineyard, and uh, had a great time out there. I got some awesome drone footage. We'll cover that in a little bit. And uh, now we're back here at the Tasting House. Yeah, this yeah. is our century-old tasting house in Dundee. Yeah, and uh, so we're going to go through some wines here. So, Tracy, kind of tell me, um, how did you get into all this? Absolutely. Um, I had sort of a circuitous route, I would say. Um, I am from Seattle originally, and I was going to the University of Washington, getting a master's in global health. Mm -hmm. um, became a little bit disenchanted with sort of the nonprofit world and what that was going to look like. I'd always loved wine. I grew up and my godfather was a collector here in Oregon, actually lived in Portland, um, and had lived in Europe for quite a long time. So introduced me to really nice wines when I was pretty young, mm -hmm. um, and I became passionate that way. And so I wanted to take a break between the master's program and writing my thesis, um, decided why don't I go work a harvest? I'll get my hands dirty, kind of clear my head. It'll also give me a chance to do something super cool in my 20s that I can talk to people about forever, right? Yeah. And I'll know so much more about wine. And so I came down, got hired at Tory Moore, kind of last minute, didn't know anything about it, didn't know really anything about them, um, but I just caught the bug. I mean, I was the intern that was like, let me clean the press, teach me how to clean the line, can I stay later, can I work on Saturday? I actually lived with a friend down at Christum, and I would get up at midnight and do their midnight punch downs with them. Oh, wow. So I got to learn also from Steve Dorner at that time. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll take a little more time. I found out you could go to New Zealand and Australia and do Southern Hemisphere and come back. And five years later, I got hired full time at Adelsheim. <laughs> so kept traveling and doing harvests. Um, got hired as a seller master or a seller assistant there and then promoted to anologist. I uh, met my husband, who was the seller master at the time. Worked together for four years there. Um, and that's actually how I got to know Jay and Jean Nicola. Mm -hmm. So when they started Nicholas Jay, they decided that they would do not really a formal custom crush situation, but they would rent space in a larger winery so that they could invest in good people, good grapes, you know, the things that really matter in starting a winery versus building sort of that monument to yourself okay. before you know what you need. So they came into uh, Adelsheim to make wine. And I remember. Dave Page, who was the winemaker at the time, uh, came into the lab at one point and he said, none of you know who Jean-Nic Lameo is, but he's a big deal. <laughs> we're like, okay, Dave, whatever you say. You know, as a young winemaker, you can't really afford or have access to things like Mayo Camazé, but we got this sense that he was a very knowledgeable Burgundian winemaker. Um, and I was the enologist at the time, so I was running all of red fermentation. That was a huge part of my job during harvest. So even though they were sort of their separate wine make, winery, they had a winemaker helping them. Um, I got to work a lot, particularly with Jay, who's here for every harvest for mm -hmm. six weeks, boots on the ground, hands in the vats, punch downs, carrying bins. Um, so I got to know them and really um, became quite passionate about what they were doing and really enjoyed who they were as people. So when they decided to look for a new winemaker that spring, um, I raised my hand and it was a good fit. So now it's we just did our sixth vintage, which is crazy to think about how right. far we've come. Um, but, you know, really in those early days, it was just the three of us making wine and traveling the country trying to sell it and launching the brand and all the fun things that go with a new winery. Yeah, I, I would have to just think about it. it's only been six vintages. That means I probably met Jay in like the second vintage or something. Yeah. Because it's, it's somewhere four-ish years ago, maybe three years ago that, yeah. that I met him. It's probably um, right when we were launching. Yeah, because he came out came out San Antonio and, um, you know, I, I say where I worked before him, Morton's, <laughs> uh, and I remember, I remember tasting the wine. So, 
Uh, and that's that's why I also wanted to come out here yeah. because I remember that. So, um, so yeah. So you kind of kind of rolled the the history of uh, Nicolas J and you into one. Um, is there anything about the beginnings of the winery that uh, you want to roll into? You want to like just go into the the vineyard kind of thing? Yeah, the story about the vineyard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think. One of the things, I mean, there are many things that make Nicholas J unique, mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that makes it unique is that when they decided to start this winery, you know, Jay and Jean Nicolas have been friends for a long time. They actually met back in um, graduate school. Uh, Jean Nicolas went to school with Jay's sister, Jill, back at UPenn, and that's how she, he met Jay, and they maintained this long friendship. And so when they decided to start this winery, rather than saying, okay, we're going to buy this vineyard and build this winery and start a brand, they just started tasting. And okay. because of jean Nicolas' name and Jay's dynamic personality, they were able to get into all these different cellars, right? Oregon's quite open community. So they could taste, you know, wineries like Adelsheim that source from 15 different vineyards or Chapter 24. All these different places would open their doors and let them barrel taste. So they were handpicking vineyards that they thought would go well together to make this Willamette Valley blend, okay. right? And we'll talk a little bit about that. But we're unique in that we focus on a blend, and it's a Willamette Valley blend. So in all this blind tasting, they kept finding this one vineyard that they both loved. They would walk out of the tasting, sit in the car and rehash their notes. And it was always this Bishop Creek vineyard. They didn't really know Bishop Creek. They'd never been there. Um, but they just kept commenting that it was one of their favorites. Could we maybe get fruit? Um, and Jay had been talking to a realtor just about what was around. And if there were vineyards for sale, let him know that we're intriguing. They didn't want to buy a vineyard, but, you know, you never know. Right, yeah. Um, and so this gentleman called him, I don't know how much later, and said, hey, I know you don't want to buy a vineyard, but this one's for sale. It's pretty intriguing. It's a little bit different than the others. You know, what do you think? Do you want to come check it out? Well, it turns out it was Bishop Creek. It was one of those very fortuitous, wonderful things that happened. And so they went and saw it. And it's 13 planted acres, right, on about 30-acre plot. And it's really isolated in the Amhill Carlton, kind of deep, tucked in the coastal range there. Um, there's five different vine spacings that happen at the vineyard. Most of it's pretty densely planted. So mm -hmm. most of it's kind of five by five, five by six. Um, and it's a lot of it is own rooted. So susceptible to phylloxera, although there isn't any yet. And so I think for a lot of people, it was daunting to think about buying a vineyard like that. It's a more expensive vineyard to farm. It's a difficult vineyard to farm. There's some risk involved with the phylloxera. But jean Nicola looked at it and said, you know, this is just like home. This is magnifique. I, yeah. I can handle this. I love this. Um, and they knew the fruit was beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, typically it's the other way around. Plant the vineyard, hope the wine is good. Right. So awesome to be able to say, we love the wine. It's our favorite wine. Oh, my gosh, we can buy this established vineyard. Yeah. So they did. And... Um, it's definitely given us a home, kind of a foundation to wrap what we do around here in Oregon. Okay. It's hard to imagine what Nicholas J would be without Bishop Creek. Right. Um, but, but yeah, it's certainly a special place, as you got to see today. I did. And speaking of the phylloxera, so um, we had to ensure that I didn't, well, in you, uh, I didn't bring any phylloxera, so we bleached our shoes. So luckily, I wear boots. <laughs> <laughs> you seemed a little sad because you have special dirt on your yeah, boots. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so long time years of the show will know everywhere I've been, I had the same pair of boots I've had for at least two or three years. So, um, so I got all, all the places I've been; those boots have been in those vineyards. So it was just kind of like, oh, that's okay. Double bleach. It needed double a bleach. double bleach. Double bleach. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a double bleach. Um, yeah. So that's really interesting, the fact. So uh, what would, you were telling me kind of why you think that um, Phylloxer hasn't really kind of taken hold in that vineyard. Yeah, I mean, I think no one really gets to know, right? There's a couple different reasons. It was farmed for a long time by Jason Lett. So mm -hmm. a lot of that, uh, those grapes went into his black cap label. And the people who were on the vineyard farming that stayed on the vineyard. So the equipment didn't move. The workers didn't move. And a lot of Phylloxera is moved by that transportation, right, of people or equipment or dogs or boots or all that yeah. stuff. So I think we've been lucky in that regard. It's also, as you'll see in the footage and as you saw today, that it's quite isolated. So you can stand at the top of that vineyard and you don't see any vineyards anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the airflow of flocks or transfer that I think you get a more tightly packed spacing here in like the Dundee Hills, for example. Mm -hmm. But there's also this theory that you can prevent phylloxera by irrigating, right? If you flood irrigate, which is what they do in Chile, for example, to prevent phylloxera on own-rooted vines, you will drown the louse. And we don't irrigate at all at Bishop Creek. It's all dry farmed. But in the winter in Oregon, inevitably, we get these rains that act almost as flood irrigation naturally. And Bishop Creek has those ancient marine sediment soils. 
So really well draining. Um, they tend to be very uh, wet in the winter and then very dry in the summer. So if you walk out there a month from now, it's just a bog, right? And then as soon as the rains stop in March, April, May, June, July, depending on the year, yeah. it dries out and cracks immediately. So great for the growing season as far as stressing out the vines and less water availability. But in the winter, super wet feet, high water table. So my new theory is that the phloxera is actually drowned. You know, that louse is drowned in the winter. So even if it's there, it can't really propagate and develop and take a stronghold. Okay. I like that theory because it means that maybe we'll never have phylloxera, whereas the other theory is a little bit more, you know, it's kind of not uh, if, it's when. Yeah. yeah. But regardless, we're doing new plantings. They're on root stock. So hopefully if we do end up getting it, we've still got another 10 or 15 years before we're going to have to deal with okay. the repercussions of replanting. All right. And uh, what, uh, what clones are you using out there? Right now, it's um, a lot of pomard. So a okay. lot of the old vine stuff is pomard, both in block one and three B. And then we have a bit of Badensville. Mm -hmm. That's about 50% of that block three. Um, we have some 667. We have two blocks, actually interesting, of triple seven. The first was Savion Blanc, was own rooted Savion Blanc that they top grafted to triple seven Pinot. Okay. So there are about 100 vines that were still Savignon Blanc that our vineyard manager actually would harvest and make in his garage. Um, so that's technically own rooted, but top grafted with triple seven. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. And then the block down below is also triple seven that was top grafted onto own rooted Chardonnay 108 clone, okay. which is that notorious California clone, right, that was planted up here and really couldn't ripen. Mm -hmm. um, so there are about 100 vines of that that we actually hand harvest that Chardonnay and co-ferment it with a tiny block of Pinot Gris that we have. So we okay. make a little Chardonnay Pinot Gris blend um, that we'll be releasing this year. But other than that, it's kind of your classic 667, Pomard, Badensville. Okay. Yeah. And that Chardonnay, that was the stuff that was in the top? Not the one I'm talking about. No. Those 100 vines that are were top grafted but lasted okay. um, are down below. Okay. And then the top of the vineyard, up around 750 feet, so up that mm -hmm. big hillside, that was all older vine Pinot Gris okay. that was on rootstock. So 3309 and 10114, we actually top grafted three, now three and four years ago to Chardonnay. And we've planted a lot of new Chardonnay. It's a blend of clones up there, so trying to do more of a Masal selection. Okay. Um, and that's, we started in 17, 18, and we have 19 as well. So okay. beautiful. Bishop Creek tends to be, we'll taste it, but very mineral driven as a wine, as a Pinot Noir. And that's showing through as well in the Chardonnay, which is okay. exciting to see. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was cool to see all that. Um, and then uh, there's there something else about the vineyard I don't remember that maybe you talked about that I was going to bring up, but I don't remember. If, if I remember, we'll, okay. we'll backtrack. <laughs> Sounds so, good. Um, so, yeah, um, you – and then your winery – or well, not your winery, your, where do you, you're making wine at – Soko Blosser. Soko right Blosser, yeah. That's yeah. right, yeah. Which yeah. I was at a couple days ago. So, well, small world. I mean, as far as small the, valley. Yeah, as far as the episode is concerned, it's like a like a week or two ago. Yeah. But I was there a couple days ago. So, but you have, but you're planning a winery, right? Yes. Yeah. We are. It's my life right now. Okay. Um, yeah. So we've done. We did three years at Adelsheim. Mm -hmm. We've now been hosted for three years at Sokol Blosser, which has been great. It's given us the chance to sort of focus again on the fruit, right? get buy better grapes, put money into that and the infrastructure and the people. Um, we have our own little sort of corner of Sokol Blosser. So we make wine completely our own way with mostly our own equipment. Um, but we share sort of the big space, right? Okay. And the big pieces of equipment like the distemmer and the sorting line and all of that. Right. Um, but we did in December, we closed on a 53 acre property in the Dundee Hills. So it's actually on the north side. So it should be a cooler site. Um, we have some really nice aspects to that hill, but the main hillside is north facing. Um, it has an old barn that was a cattle ranch, uh, and it's a gravity flow barn that's sort of dug into the hillside. So we're going to renovate that. They're, they just started construction yesterday. They oh, wow, cool. um, It's very exciting. We have this span of 10 days of sun, so it's like all the excavation you can do. Yeah. Um, so that should be done for 2020. Um, and that'll house all of our Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. We'll have our own little production there and a tasting room as well. Mm -hmm. And then we're slowly going to plant. There's about 26 acres total of plantable land, and we're okay. going to slowly plant that over time. So right now we're prepping about seven acres in different parcels for the initial planting um, and selecting those clones and rootstocks. And then jean Nicolas is actually planning on bringing over um, vines. He doesn't know exactly from which vineyards yet, but okay. Clovisot, Richebourg, 
those, propagating those, bringing them over through UC Davis, the foundation plant services, propagating them and planting sort of a must haul selection from one of those vineyards on the site. Okay. So super excited, hoping that's going to happen. Um, but that would be sort of the next phase of planting. Okay. So doing everything with care and deliberation and in a timely way. All right. So the stuff that he brings over, you said, so is well, UC Davis going to like quarantine it? Is that what's going to yeah. happen? Okay. We're doing it above ground. No bootleg clones this time. As <laughs> tempting as that may be. <laughs> um, when you said all that, there was something else about, about, the, um, about the vineyard and the winery. And I don't know if I remember, I will get we'll all do right. It again. Sounds good. But, um, so yeah, should we get into maybe uh, one of the wines here then? Yeah. Yeah. We can taste the Willamette Valley and talk about maybe some of the other sites that go into the blend. Okay. Yeah, sure. So we started in 14. I'm going to pour you actually the 15 and 16 Willamette Valleys. Okay. Um, we have conceptually always sort of been swimming upstream with these wines because okay. in Oregon, typically, it's not always true, but typically if you see Willamette Valley on the label, it's what didn't go into people's other wines, okay. right? So they make a bunch of single vineyards or AVA designates or some way that they put them all together. And then the leftovers or whatever else is around goes into this Willamette Valley. For us, we set out from the beginning to make a Willamette Valley blend. Um, we wanted this to showcase what the vintage was, um, how you could bring wines together as a winemaker to make a more dynamic wine than each of its parts individually, um, and to allow wine that's sort of consistent year in and year out as this beautiful expression of Willamette with sort of vintage variation. Okay. Um, it's hard because the price point reflects a wine with a lot of care and deliberation and also some of the best vineyards that the northern Willamette Valley has to offer. Um, and it's not what people expect from Willamette Valley, but it's been fun to sort of educate in that and to elevate brand Willamette Valley. Yeah. Okay. So this is a blend of eight different vineyards. Um, we've kind of slowly tweaked them over the years, but now we have our core set that we love and the growers. We work really well with the growers, mm -hmm. sort of farming from day one. 50% um, of it is always from Bishop Creek. So with those 13 planted acres, that ends up being a pretty high percentage, wow. right, of that Willamette Valley. And then we source from Hopewell uh, down in the Ola Amity, which is farmed by Mimi Castile. Okay. It's doing a lot of really neat sustainability stuff right now, huge focus in the valley. Um, Temperance Hill, which is an older site farmed by Die Crisp um, that's in that same area. Highland, so we get 1976 Cory clone from Highland, some of the oldest vines in Oregon. Okay. Um, that's in McMinnville. Mumtazi as well is in McMinnville. We get about five tons from them. Beautiful high elevation 115 clone right in the foothills of that coastal range, right? So the wind comes in at night, cools it down. Super bright acid, really pretty fruit. Tends to be kind of a um, both an acid backbone and a fruit backbone for the Willamette Valley. Okay. Uh, we source from Nisa here in the Dundee Hills, um, which is planted right about the same time as Bishop Creek, also own rooted, is slowly coming to phylloxera, succumbing to phylloxera. But what's neat about that is at the end, you get these really small berries, really small clusters as those vines kind of push to survive. Yeah. Um, it's a very soft, very pretty, elegant wine. Uh, La Colina, which is a site that's sort of on the, I guess that would be the south east or southwest side of the Dundee Hills. Mm -hmm. um, it's triple seven. It really lends that like gorgeous red fruited richness to the wine. I think I didn't count as I was saying them, but I think that's everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be like you. One will, one will come to me. But, one will come to you. Yeah. And, and, and if you forgot someone, if no, no disrespect, right? <laughs> exactly. We love you all equally. <laughs> yeah. So um, just finished harvest. I've only had one yeah. day off, so forgive me. <laughs> So you, you actually mentioned the acid, and I mean, as you were talking, my mouth was still watering from the acid. Mm. I mean, we're not talking like something blanc acid, but I mean, there's still a really good fresh acidity to that. Uh, the fruit is really there. It's really smooth, really nice. Um, and yeah, like you said, the you know, being just a Willamette Valley um, label is really deceptive because mm -hmm. it really tastes and um, the structure and everything, you're kind of like, you think it would be a, um, a sub appellation or yeah. maybe even a single vineyard type of thing. So yeah, it really has that quality to it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, it's tricky. There's no, there's no value statement, right? It's mm -hmm. not a blend is not better than a single vineyard. A single vineyard is not better than a blend. They're just showcasing you something different. 
you know, when you taste the single vineyard, I want you to feel like you're back at Bishop Creek and you're looking at those old vines and you see the soil on your boots. The Willamette Valley is really more about showing you what we can do. If we take the very best sites for us in the northern Willamette and blend them together, theoretically, we can make a wine that's really dynamic. So that's yeah. always the goal. We're making wine in the same way Jean-Nicolas does at Mayo Camazé. It's the only way we know how, right? So in 14, he really brought his winemaking, what he calls his canvas, over to Oregon. And we did that exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And subsequently, we've sort of modified it, altered it, tweaked it. He's a very well-educated, very dynamic winemaker with a very open mind and, and excitement to learn about Oregon. And so for him, it's always, how can I make the best Oregon wine possible, not Burgundy in Oregon, yeah. right? You can never make Burgundy in Oregon. Everything is different right. except the grape, right? Mm -hmm. So we've tweaked, we've pulled back a little bit on cap management, trying to keep freshness and brightness and softness. Um, Oregon is is inevitably more generous than Burgundy is in most regards. We have warm vintages here, a lot of heat, a lot of sunshine. We get a lot of tannin, a lot of fruit, a lot of weight. And so how do we pull back and try to restrain the wines? Because we want wines of elegance, balance, precision, that are upright, that are going to age for a long time, that are going to pair well with food. Mm -hmm. For me, a 15% alcohol Pinot Noir is not a food wine anymore. It's not an age-worthy <laughs> wine anymore. People love it, and there's a style, and there's a certain yumminess factor, but yeah. that's not what we want to make, right? Mm -hmm. We want to make low alcohol bright wines. Yeah. So for us, it's all about how do you kind of cage the beast, right? Cage these warm vintages. We just went through a very cool vintage. It was very, it was unbelievably exciting to be able to work with the vintage to make the wines. Right. But often what we're trying to do is pull back. Um, there's been a string, 14, 15, 16, kind of 17, 18, all hot, mm -hmm. right? And that seems to be the way of it with yeah. 19 as a bit of an exception wild card, but, um, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> so I remember a couple of things like when the vineyards were talking about um, about your about the your concentrate in the vineyard and how what works well there may not work well somewhere mm -hmm. else and the fact that you've made one in two different places even like your cat management and things like that where you what you do necessarily wouldn't even work with maybe what Alzheimer does yeah. or or so called Blosser does as far as the winemaking stuff. So, um, so I remember that. Yeah, that and holistic then, sense. Yeah. yeah, and then you you basically brought it up like in Burgundy, um, it's not unusual to basically you're dealing with negotiants. I mm -hmm. tell people all the time. It's I mean I'm not saying that you know like I said just because it's a single vineyard or just because it's a state fruit doesn't make it any better or worse than a blend. Yeah. And I I always bring up that that's what they do in Burgundy. Yeah. They 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 blend. It's I mean yeah they have this, they have stuff they own and they control and all that but having gone there and just seeing you know, how small these parcels are. Yeah. You know, somebody has a single row of vines. Like, <laughs> right. You have to blend that with something. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you are, you are sourcing out, you know, a lot of stuff. So. Well, if you uh, think about it critically, right. Yeah. Like we've, t I talked about a couple of those different sites and what they bring, but if you have this beautiful, soft red fruit prettiness from Nisa combined with the acidity and the brightness of Mamtazi and the tannin structure of Temperance Hill. I mean, think about how you can put all those together to layer a more complex mm -hmm. wine. Yeah. It maybe isn't the same kind of expression of terroir. You may love to see the terroir of Nisa. Or you may love how Nisa exhibits itself. So you may prefer that wine, but really we can build you a more balanced wine. Yeah just by making the very best wine possible out of each of those sites, right? Honoring those growers, honoring those vineyards. We're so non-interventionist, right? For us, it's really about how can we keep the, the fruit intact, mm -hmm. coming off the vine into the vat. We're obviously destemming everything, right? We're still making wine as Jean-Nicolas learned from Henri Jaillet. We both really like destemmed wines, um, but we want those berries to be whole. So we pick into eighth ton bins, a lot of people are picking into quarter ton, half ton bins. We're picking into eighth ton bins and we're filling them two layers full. Okay. So very precious. Um, we actually control all the buckets. So instead of the, the uh, pickers just kind of tossing the grapes in, we take the buckets and gently put the grapes into the bins. Uh, we make sure when they get to the winery, they stay cold. We have usually between six and 10 people on the sorting line. A very high end stemmer technology that we're using. So everything we're doing from step one is how do we get those berries to be whole and perfect? Okay. And that's where we're going to focus our energy, not what can we add to the wine? How can we modify the wine? How can we tweak it? We want it to come from the fruit okay. and really respecting that fruit. So in, in that you're trying to make sure that you don't have any damage to the berries ahead of time. So when you, when you put them together, are you allowing, 
are you doing some carbonic first or are you do, going right to pressing it? We're going basically straight into the fermenter. Okay. And then starting cap management. So we're going to a five to seven day cold soak. Okay. Right. And they're whole berries, but no matter what, no matter how good the stemmer is, they're still taking the berry off the vine. Right. So you're creating that opening, right? That's mm -hmm. going to allow, it's going to make it so you're not getting carbonic maceration. Okay. And that's what we're trying to avoid by destemming. You also end up, no matter what, between maybe 5 and 50% broken berries to some point so that you're getting enough juice to be able to do those pump overs. Okay. So we're all pump overs until we get to almost dryness when we do gentle pajage just to break up whatever might still be whole. Okay. Um, but all that initial cap management is done with pump overs. Um, we're allowed... We're, able to cold soak longer because the fruit is in good shape, right? Mm -hmm. Without having any kind of off aromas or any kind of damage to the fruit. And then we warm it up naturally, typically, um, and allow it to kick off spontaneous fermentation and keep that really gentle pump over regime. Okay. So I think, I don't know for sure, but for me, what I think is that we have less, um, tannin extraction, much less seed tannin extraction, okay. a gentler extraction process that allows us to have wines that have more finesse and elegance and beauty in them okay. versus sort of the broad shouldered, clunkier, heavier wines that you can get when you're really breaking up those berries and extracting from the skins and the seeds and okay. the pulp. All right, cool. Um, this wine is delicious. Thank you. Um, you know, I think like how you described it as far as taking individual, um, or different vineyards and, and combining them together. I think you know you're you're getting that structure. You're getting you're getting that um, uh, harmony mm -hmm. of, of of different aspects of what they bring. Um, it's like being a chef and having all yeah. the having all the ingredients. You know, you can put all those ingredients together and just to make a dish. You might take something out and it will change it. Doesn't make mm -hmm. it any better or worse necessarily. It just makes it different. Yeah. Add something else to it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this is a really good representation of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Thank you. Fifteen was tricky. Fifteen was the hottest vintage we've ever had on record. Mm -hmm. More days over a hundred in Oregon. So we started picking in August. We were finished by the second week of September. We really fought that by early picking, trying to make sure that the acidity was still there, that there was still brightness and freshness. Yeah. It actually ended up being an under 13% alcohol wine in the hottest vintage Oregon has ever seen. Yeah. So that's really amazing. quite different than what you normally yeah. see from a 15. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing, especially when the, the picking, you know, picking early, I'm sure, really helped you not have those high alcohol. It's really the only way you can fight it unless you're going to do yeah. some kind of modification in the winery, right. right? And, you know, everyone has their style and everyone has their approach. And so right. none are better or worse than anyone else. But for us, it's about I want to keep that fruit fresh, right? Yeah. I want to keep it bright. I want the fruit to be able to showcase itself. I don't want to have to add anything. Mm -hmm. Or remove anything. Exactly. Or remove anything. Yeah, you don't want to do any <laughs> osmosis. And stuff. Yeah. So I, Blasphemy. It, it, is this going to be a little off topic? And not, I'm not asking you for the for the, how to make the sausage. But <laughs> um, but uh, I went to the Texas Hill Country Wine Winery Symposium in January. Oh, fun. So... Like I said, like I, I, I've told a lot of people things that I, I oh, so like, you know, that when I talk about the, I, I read the leaf pulling article, yeah, I said someone yeah. went over my head. Well, a lot of that stuff went over my head. I, I, I specifically went to like the winemaker, like Good for seminars. You. That's awesome. So as much, as much as I could. Yeah. Um, and one of them was, you know, a gentleman talking about, you know, finding the alcohol sweet spot. Mm -hmm. He's also the same guy that tells you the right music will make wine taste differently, which some of it's a little hocus pocus, but some of it actually is legit. Uh, Jay probably believes in yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I did. So <laughs> right? yeah, Jay and I have that, have that music connection. Yeah. Um, cause that was my degree in college. Oh really? So oh, yeah. Nice. Um, there's a lot of music and wine overlap. Absolutely. And I use music as a, um, during my reviews, I use music a lot for my, uh, uh, my scribe wines. I never yeah. see a review, but yeah. sometimes it just a musical Resonates. reference. Yeah. yeah going to resonance later today nice yes. <laughs> say hi to guillaume he's a I, good well, friend well yeah i'm gonna hang out with guillaume <laughs> good um so uh anyway so yeah he, he talked about osmosis and mm -hmm. like manip it, it's manipulation like it you know that's, that's the word for it but you're trying to find a sweet spot so that and some sometimes a lower alcohol was the sweet spot for that yeah. particular wine sometimes the higher alcohol was but you know dialing in dialing that in so yeah you can i don't really talk about it too much in here um it, at least not uh, I don't really talk about it a lot in the interviews, but even reviews. Um, but yeah, you know, you can you can be as hands off. And I know mm -hmm. you guys are very low interventionist. 
uh, or you can be very you can, hands on. You can be very hands on, and you can just like I just want I want a wine to taste a certain way, and there isn't necessarily anything wrong with either way. You know, it's just a different philosophy. Yeah, it's it's like you know any other any other philosophical thing in life. You know, we can have different philosophies, but you know, and that's fine. Just you can agree to disagree. I guess you want exactly <laughs> you do that. Yeah, but as long as the end goal is making something delicious for somebody, that that should be good. So it's true. Well, uh, and alcohol is yeah. a good point. I mean, it brings up this idea of balance, right? Mm -hmm. For me, making the the very best wine I can means that when you taste and smell that, you just think beauty, right? Right. Beauty and harmony. If you taste and smell this, and you think alcohol, mm -hmm. acid, you right. know, anything, a flaw, any of that then I've not done my job right because it stops you and it distracts you. It means the wine's out of balance. The acid is jumping out or the alcohol is jumping out. Right. It should be the kind of wine that stops you, but because it's beautiful. Yeah. Not because there's something disjointed about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've brought up, I think, on most of the interviews, you know, I, there's a time and a place for a lot of these wines. And I had, for my Halloween episode, I reviewed a wine. I did like a, a, a tequila, a wine, and a mead. No fun. And I normally do three wines. Yeah. But this time I wanted something different. And uh, the one I reviewed is a Napa Hillside Cab, and it's mm -hmm. big and bold and definitely high alcohol. And um, but there's a delicious factor, yeah. and it's not my normal style of wine. But about and a Corvin and everything, so I didn't have to like drink it fast. But probably three or four days after I recorded that, I was like, I'm looking at what I want to drink. I was like. I'm going to drink that because I'm in the mood for that. Yeah, I know. You know? Well, sometimes that's what you want, I'm right? I'm in the mood for a highly manipulated yeah. wine. <laughs> because it, it, I don't know. I don't think it had Mega Purple in it, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a $30 bottle of wine. It doesn't mean it won't because I know there's bottles of wine with $75 that absolutely have Mega Purple in it. <laughs> yeah. Or Mega Purple. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. enough of that stuff. Let's get to, into what we've got Sounds here. Sounds good. So this is the 2016 version of the Willamette Valley. Okay. So just the really the next vintage. Slightly different vintage, a little bit cooler, um, but interestingly for us, a little bit higher alcohol. So because it was cooler, we were allowed to hang those grapes a little bit longer mm -hmm. without losing what we wanted as far as balance in the wine. The longer, in general, Pinot Noir can hang, the better, right? It gains more phenolo what we call phenological ripeness, so mm -hmm. better mouthfeel, better flavors. The tannins start to polymerize and become a little bit softer. Um, but it just depends on the season. If all we're seeing is dehydration and shrivel on the vine, we're not trying to concentrate our wine, which is all you're doing at that point, right? right. So if they're ripening and they're sitting on the vine and they're developing good flavors and they still look really healthy and the canopy looks healthy, then great, by all means, we'll keep it out there, right? We're not scared to keep it out. We just want to make sure the development is positive. Okay. And there's there's this whole philosophy of 100 days post bloom with Pinot Noir. Yes. Right. You have bloom, and then you pick 100 days later, and you're pretty much good to go. I will say, as much as I don't want that to be true, there is some truth to that. What I think, though, is that we are starting to see the season shift, and so we're actually getting bloom earlier in the year, which means that we're having a lot more ripening time and important ripening days during the equinox. So okay. if we have longer days, more hours of sunlight, more hours of heat during those really integral growing times, 100 days may be too much, right? Or maybe more than we need to make okay. the kind of wine that we want to make. When we used to have a lot of ripening happening in October, I mean, you, you're you here yeah. right now, it's October, <laughs> right? There's like six hours of sunlight. So you think about how much growing you actually get during those October days versus what you get in June when we have 13, 14, 15, 16 hours of sunlight in a day. Right. So I think it's shifted it a little bit. I think there are many people that will disagree with me on that, but that's certainly what we're seeing. The 15 had, a lot of those vineyards had 88 days post-bloom, and we picked them, or 85. Okay. And I find the wine to be very developed, beautiful fruit, very yeah. polymer, you know, all those things that we're looking for. So. Well, and like, so like a day like today, uh, and you'll, you'll definitely correct me, uh, or at least re-educate me. So at sunrise, it was... Under 50 degrees, mm -hmm. like in the 40s. Yes. So if the vineyard is getting the sun, it's not really doing anything until it gets to a little bit high. Is it just somewhere in the 50s? That Yeah, it's got to be in the mid to high 50s, 60s to really be feeling like you're going to gain ripening. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so even if it's six hours, it's even less because the temperature, if it's, it's so much too lower. cold, it's not going to do anything. It's just sitting there. Exactly. Okay. 
And our yeah. summer temperatures now are pretty high, right, lately. Yeah. So you, it could be 100 days or 100 degrees in June. I got married on June 25th uh, in 2015. Yeah. And it was 105. You know, I mean, that's really unusual. So we're seeing more and more of that, which means we're getting so much more ripening early on. Okay. It's just shifting. But even at 105, the, the vines are shutting down too, right? Correct. There's yeah. No so that's a bad no example too. Yeah. Yeah. There's no respiration going on above us. No. Certain, yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what it's like. It's like 90 something. It's the high remember. 90s. Yeah. You start to see the vines shutting down. Yeah. yeah. Um, see, I do learn things. <laughs> Actually, I think I, I think I got re-educated on that at the symposium or something like Those that. Those things are good to go to. We have one every year too. It's yeah. very beneficial. I, I have no plans to ever really do what you do because I, I, I have absolute mad respect for anyone that does goes out there and day in and day out is in the is in the vineyard and cleaning tanks and doing all stuff. Um, I, I, I probably, could, I probably could, I know I could do it if I really It's easier than selling to. wine, yeah. Mark. I have mad respect <laughs> for people who sell wine because I've had to do a lot of that and it's really hard. <laughs> and, and that's, that's kind of the funny thing. Uh, so in a previous incarnation of, of, uh, restaurant life, uh, I, I worked at a place that had off duty police officers as security guards. Not that we were an unsafe place. It's just, that's what they did mm -hmm. actually in two different places. And I had some of these guys that worked at the jail said, I could never do your job. Yeah, I'm like, I believe it. I was like, <laughs> People really? are meaner. So I was like, you guys are dealing with the criminals. Like, you, I mean, I know they're like locked up, but I yeah. mean, to me, it's like at any moment, like your life could be in danger, not mine. <laughs> so, well, you know, I think it's a matter of perspective, you know. It's as, true. Yeah, but, um, it's true. but I do enjoy like learning about this stuff and like, you know, uh, either reading chemistry books that are way above my head, like I did last year, or <laughs> like going to symposiums and, yeah. and reading just unusual stuff and, and then doing things like this, actually talking to the winemakers uh, or talking to people who are the vineyard managers and, yeah. and asking them the complicated questions and they hopefully make it more layman's terms for me, but that's, that's kind of why I do what I do. Too. It's awesome. Well, yeah. it's good for us to think through too. You yeah. Know? Sometimes you put your head down and you're working and it's fun to pick it up and sort of think through why are you doing the things you're doing and how mm -hmm. is it working and how is it being received and yeah. is it coming together the way you want? And sometimes like for me, I had to relearn things. Like I couldn't remember what a thigh all was the other day. I'm like, oh, what was that again? I had to look it up <laughs> Yeah. so I could talk intelligently about it. <laughs> right. It's always good. Thank God for resources. Yeah. Um, so on the wine, um, it does feel like even though um, you picked pretty early, it feels like there's a little more richness to it uh, mm -hmm. than the 14. You know, other than the 15, the, the 16 feels a little more rich. A little, there's, I think, more fruit development on it. It's a little bit darker on the fruit for me. Definitely. You know? Yeah, picked a little bit later. Still in that 13 to 13 and a half percent alcohol mm -hmm. range, right? So still low, um, but definitely a little bit richer. Has been out of the gate. And I think the 16s across the board in Oregon are more that way. They all have sort of an earth-driven component to it that mm -hmm. I think is really complex and fascinating. But a lot of fruit, um, a lot of prettiness, too, to back it up. Yeah. Less extreme than 15. You know, it has just a little bit more softness and sort okay. of richness to it. Yeah. No, it's really nice. And it's one of those wines where, you know, it's kind of hard to pick. It, it, it would depend on my mood. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One day I would rather have the 16, one day I would rather have the 15. I always so, tell yeah. people, get obviously, buy both. You can tell I'm a good salesperson. Yeah, there you buy go. Them all. Buy them all. Um, yeah. <laughs> drink the 16 now, hold on to the 15. The 15 yeah. has just gotten better and better and better. It's like a sleeper because of that. It's slightly leaner, slightly more upright, right? Time yeah. is doing wonders for it. 16 was a little bit more approachable out the gate. I think it's going to be a great wine to age, but it's a little bit easier and softer already, I think, than the 15. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it's just you know, approachable is a great way to put it. It's, 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 got, it's got everything you want, like, right now. And while you could wait for it, you know, at least enjoy some of it now. Maybe, yeah. Maybe lay some down. Yeah. Buy a couple cases. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Open there you go. Sales. <laughs> Getting that sales going. <laughs> Tell <it's> terrible. <laughs> oh, well. I keep making the wine. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll sell the wine. You make the wine. Perfect. Okay. I love it. So this is Bishop Creek. All right. So we make, we're about 3,000 case production um, at this stage. And 90, 90 to 95% of that is the Willamette Valley. So mm -hmm. really is our flagship. But of course, you fall in love with a couple of sites, and then you want to showcase for people what those sites are. Mm -hmm. And how the idea is, how do they come together to make the Willamette Valley, but you get to see those individual components. 
So this is the Bishop Creek, one of three single vineyards. We also we also make Momtazi and Nisa okay. into single vineyards. Um, and what was the vintage on this one again? This is 16, 16 as well. Okay. So that's the current release of the Bishop Creek. Um, and Bishop Creek, again, makes up 50% of these wines. So hopefully you'll see sort of where that um, darkness and that depth and that complexity and structure is coming from. Most of that is lent from Bishop Creek into the wines. This is all the older vines, so planted back in 1988. Predominantly Pomard. There's a little bit of Vadensville, a little bit of 777, and a little bit of 667 blended into the wine. So it could be partially power suggestion, um, but I feel like I am getting like a component, like I'm, I'm, gave, I'm able to like kind of focus on like a single ingredient mm -hmm. uh, from, from these other wines. Cool. Um, you know, it's definitely enhanced on that. Um, it feels like I'm getting more of that darker fruit. Um, there's also kind of, a, I, I don't get in these, but I felt like there was a little bit of a mintiness to it, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, is it? evident in here um and it just could be because everything else is just mixed together it just kind of stays in the background or maybe it'll yeah. show up an hour later if i'm drinking it you know yeah. so um but yeah there's i feel there's a little more intensity to this um a little more power and structure to it um it's yeah, a it's, powerful structure yeah. vineyard for yeah. sure <laughs> i mean it's delicious and it's one of those things where okay what what mood am i in do i want do I want the bishop or do I want like maybe the, the, the mixture of everything, you know, and no one wine is necessarily better than the other. Like you've mm -hmm. already kind of said, um, it's just kind of what you're looking for, for out of that wine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way I always try to look at it. It's tough because we have to put price on things, right? And right. so all of a sudden we assign a value because there's a price. But that can be, I mean, we all know that that's very market driven in, in a lot of different ways. And the reality is we make 150 cases of this mm -hmm. and about 2,000 cases of this. So that in and of itself sort of drives that price. Um, mm -hmm. We're obviously very proud of Bishop Creek and love Bishop Creek. But again, this is the baby, right? This is the darling. Yeah. And that's really a way to show that, that piece, that essence, that backbone of this wine. Yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, scarcity is one of the things that drives price. Absolutely. You know, out, you know, that's one element besides everything else that goes into the winemaking, you know, um, and then just brand and then demand, you know. Um, so uh, <laughs> so I, I think I've already mentioned this in, in a prior episode. But I have um, a future episode where I have six uh, California Cabernets from 16. That have mm. a wide range of prices, yeah, and a very wide range of prices, and I'm going to do them blind. I was going to say, are you going to blind them? I'm going to blind them. I mean, obviously, it's I know fascinating which, when you I actually it. know all six wines. I bought yeah. them all, but I'm going to have them poured. I'm going to pour them. I'm going to have them brought to me blind, and I'm I'm just going to go through it. And it's I a hope humbling I exercise, my friend. <laughs> I hope I don't upset anybody. Let's put it yeah. that way. Um, I mean, I when I do my reviews, I never just flat out just say this wine sucks. I just may say, I don't like the wine. Um, I usually try to find something that I submit the wine yeah. uh, if I don't like it. I mean, I'll say I don't like it, but I'm yeah. not going to be like, oh, this wine's horrible. It's well, pretty It's a preference, rare. right? Yeah. I mean, someone's going to like it, yeah. probably. Unfortunately, there's been a few wines that I'm like, they definitely were just poorly made or there was yeah. something wrong and I have to say something about it. But so in this, in this, in this future episode, I don't expect to have anything like that. Yeah. But I might be like, so I think this is the, you know, I think this is the, Twenty dollar bottle of wine, and I hope it's not the hundred dollar bottle of wine. You know, I can tell you every time I've done that, something has yeah. happened. Yeah, so, <laughs> some kind of entertainment. But at the same time, I think the the purpose of that episode is to kind of show that um, the price isn't always the quality, but there's some aspects why the price is yeah. the way it is, and it could be you know a scarcity thing, it could be a brand thing, it could be it could be just something about they use a hundred percent French New Oak. Yeah, exactly. It's expensive. You know, and, yeah, there's a reason why. Yeah. Maybe just that particular wine on that particular day just didn't show as well as yeah. something that was less expensive. So yeah. I don't expect the really expensive wine and the cheapest wine to flip. I definitely don't expect that. It's unusual, <laughs> especially if you're talking about $20, right? It's very yeah. hard to make a wine at $20 anymore. I mean, yeah. grapes are expensive. Personnel is expensive. Infrastructure is expensive. I mean, everything, marketing, your yeah. glass. I mean, it's just Especially if you're your doing small production. Are, yeah. Yeah, and especially if you're getting good grapes, right? It all mm -hmm. starts with the grapes, and that's yeah. where all of our money goes, right? And that's why we're able to make these nice wines. But um, you can't, I mean, discount grapes or discount grapes, right? That's right. Yeah. It just is what it is. And, you know, that's, and that's fine. 
It is, That's yeah. Fine, cause and it's important to I, have I that. I can't be balling at 50 bucks a day. <laughs> and how are people supposed to get into wine? Yeah. I often have interns that want to talk about this, right? It's yeah. really disturbing to them. They don't like to see big production wineries adding things and doing different stuff. And I keep saying to them, you need to have that $15 bottle of wine. You need Absolutely. to have that $25 wine. There's a place for that. That's how you get into Pinot Noir. Right. <laughs> I started with Yellowtail. Yeah. I mean... It's embarrassing, but it happens. Like, you know, you've got to start yeah. somewhere. Hey, you and then know what? you grow and develop. I didn't necessarily start with it, but I, in in my early, early days, I crushed a lot of two buck chuck. Oh, totally. I mean, Thank it God was, Trader Joe's. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was the thing. And, um, and, and you were fancy because you brought wine to the party, you know, I mean, yeah, it didn't matter. So, that it was and I, I defended it. I was like for $3 is really good. <laughs> exactly. And I probably could still say the same for $3, you know, yeah. I mean, and there are beautiful wines made here in Oregon for $20 yeah. and there are not such good wines. And I could say that probably at any price point, but mm -hmm. there are some people who are really doing amazing work, right? Yeah. Giving people great entry level wines. Yeah. And that, and I think, you know, that, so the bottom line is there's a wine for everybody at every price point. So if you can afford the expensive stuff, you know, then absolutely enjoy it. If you can't afford it, there's definitely stuff that's out there. That's quality stuff. That's 20 bucks or even under $20. So, I mean, uh, again, I, I can't say where I work, but where I do work, <laughs> we have a lot of wines that are under $20 and I've reopened my eyes to that. There's actually good quality stuff in that under $20 range. Yeah, absolutely. Know? Um, and that's how my show started was under $20 oh, neat. and I, I reviewed that stuff. And as I got into the fancier and fancier, you know, environments and got seduced by the more expensive wines, yeah. my palate w gravitated towards that. And now I'm not in that. I mean, I, we, we sell, we sell expensive stuff too, but now, but most of the people that come in don't want 50, 60, $80 yeah, bottles of, of wine. They not. want, they want $15. They want $20. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I've re, re gone, I mean, I've gone back into like, oh, wow, this is, this is good. Yeah. All right. Is it a $50 bar one? No, but that doesn't need to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. They can't all be. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the wine is, the wine is excellent. Um, is there anything else maybe we should kind of go through or did we forget? I know. I'm trying to think. Did you, did you remember any of their vineyards? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Did we hit them all? <laughs> We're trying not to think well, Doc. Um, I think we did, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, you and I were talking a little bit in the vineyard and you touched on it, but I think it's a really important point that the whole winemaking process, and we've really seen this since we have this Burgundy-Oregon comparison, mm -hmm. yeah. is very holistic, right? You can't pull out one piece or another piece and think that you can make the same wine as someone else or you can just alter your style in that way and it's going to work. Everything we do from day one lends itself to this wine particularly. And the fact that we do pump overs and if someone else does punch down, switching those isn't going to make that wine our wine and our wine that right, wine, right? Yeah. And so that's true of every ecosystem, every place in the world that's making wine, the microbes that live in their cellar, um, you know, the people who work in those vineyards. All those elements create this artisan sort of handcrafted product that's so unbelievably special. Mm -hmm. And we see parallels when we open up Nicholas J and Mayo Camazé now next to each other, which we've gotten to do quite a bit at dinners and different events. Right. And... Again, very different wines, right? Oregon, Burgundy. Not a lot that's the same about those two places except for the grape. But because we do similar cap management and similar things in the winery, the way that we manage the wines, there is this thread, and maybe we're the same people, right? There's this thread of texture um, and structure that seems to carry the two brands that's very similar. Okay. Um, it's fascinating to see, right? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, all of a sudden, there are different ecosystems, different places, different sort of holistic processes. Um, but there certainly are some parallels that are fun to see. It's kind of like a band, maybe like one album, they had one style, one album, they have a different style, but they still, there's still a thread of, yeah. they're still like, they, they have this, they have the same band. Yeah. They just maybe went a different direction in their musical style on a different album. Exactly. Use okay. different instruments, right? Yeah. Or different, yeah, different inputs. And then somebody was like, your, your other album was so much better. How can you change? Because <laughs> that's what we wanted to do. Exactly. We're artists at the end of the <laughs> right. day, right? Yeah. You can only do so much science. Then at some point, it's mm -hmm. about what do you smell, what do you taste, what do you see. And we're building this new winery, and someone was saying to me, you can get pneumatic punch-down tools, right? So you can have your tanks, and you can actually have a machine come along and punch them down. And I was saying, but that's – or pump-overs, too. Oh, yeah. And I was saying, but that's how I learn. That's how I learn what this tank is and what uh, I might need to do to change to – 
to fix a fermentation issue or to coax out more tannin or to coax out more flavor. They're all babies, right? They're all mm -hmm. these living organisms. And if we move away from those and we mechanize everything and stop touching them, we lose sort of that artistry, yeah. of how we get to know these living products. So Yeah. Technology should be should help you, but it shouldn't replace you. Exactly. Yeah. It's a tool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think it's a good time to wrap it up. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. So uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you. For um, spending a lot of time with me, going out into the vineyard with me, bleaching my boots. <laughs> I'm actually excited about that. Um, it's a fresh start for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got so my boots are, are brand new to like go out and 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 uh, go hit some more vineyards throughout the world. Um, it's like a reset. And, um, yeah, and, and bring us some cool wines for me. Absolutely. And uh, so, folks, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, as always, you can click the links above to friend me up. Uh, I'll have a link below uh, for the winery. Find out everything about that. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.